seven o'clock and it'll be at our house. And uh, if you want to come and you've never been there before, uh, just tell me and we'll give you the address real easy to find. And so that's this Saturday. Turn to Deuteronomy 33. We've been looking at some of these blessings that Moses gave to the children of Israel. If you can, if you have a piece of paper or something, if you can sort of mark that spot, Deuteronomy 33, because we'll be we'll be coming back to that. Uh, we're going to start there, but we're going to look at a few other places along the way. Deuteronomy 33, and this passage opens up at verse 1. It says, And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And then you come down to verse 6, and he just starts naming the tribes and uh, pronouncing uh, various blessings on them. Um, today we're at verse, uh, verse 8. Verse 8. And of Levi, he said, let thy Thummim and thy Urim be with thy Holy One, whom thou didst prove at Massa and with whom thou didst strive at the waters of Meribah, who said unto his father and to his mother, I have not seen him. Neither did he acknowledge his brethren, nor knew his own children, for they have observed thy word and kept thy covenant. They shall teach Jacob thy judgments and Israel thy law. They shall put incense before thee and whole burnt sacrifice upon thine altar. Bless, Lord, his substance and accept the work of his hands. Smite through the loins of them that rise against him and of them that hate him, that they rise not again. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your book. We thank you for the chance to be together. Lord, we pray that you'd bless as we look at your book. We pray that you'd help all of us, every one of us this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you see uh, the man Levi in verse 8. We've looked at Reuben and looked at Judah, and now we're at Levi. And with Levi, you see a curse that was turned into a blessing. Levi was another one of those guys that really didn't start off very well. Look at Genesis 49. Genesis 49. It's interesting in, in Genesis 49, when Jacob announces the future of his sons, Jacob in this passage, Jacob is about to die. And this was long, long before Deuteronomy 33. Um, when Jacob announces to his sons what is coming, he combines Levi and Simeon in this passage. And what's interesting is Levi's curse has turned into a blessing. But Simeon is not even mentioned in Deuteronomy 33. Uh, we're going to talk about why. Let's look at uh, Genesis 49 and uh, verse 5. And you see, this is the moment when Levi is literally standing, the father of the whole tribe, what would be the tribe of Levi. He is standing in front of his father at his death. And this is what Jacob says. His last words to Simeon and Levi, verse five, Simeon and Levi are brethren. He's, in other words, what he's saying is they're two peas in a pod. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. Oh, my soul, come not thou into their secret. Unto their assembly, mine honor, be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Shechem and scatter them in Israel. Man, that wouldn't be a real nice thing to hear as your dad's just passing off the scene and he's discussing your future. And man, he has nothing good to say. He is referring to an incident that occurred in Genesis 34. So go back a few more pages to your left and look at Genesis 34. 
Boy, it's amazing how one act can shadow a man or a woman's future. And only the God of heaven can change that future. Mm -hmm. But he can't change it. No. Genesis 34. Verse 1. And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, you got to remember, he's just one of the heathen in the land. And, and that group of heathen would eventually be annihilated from that territory. But this is early on, and these guys are still there. Jacob is just sort of traveling through that land. And one day, Dinah says, I want to go out and see what the girls around here are like. And uh, she winds up in a bad way. Verse 2. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. And his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And he loved the damsel and spake kindly unto the damsel. And Shechem spake unto his father Hamor, saying, Get me this damsel to wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they were come. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out into Jacob to commune with him. And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved, and they were very wroth. They, were, they had blown a gasket. Because he had wrought folly in Israel in lying with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to be done. And Hamor communed with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longeth for your daughter. I pray you, give her him to wife, and make ye marriages with us, and give your daughters unto us, and take our daughters unto you, and ye shall dwell with us. In other words, he's trying to negotiate. you got to remember, this is back in the day when that's how they did things. And they're trying to negotiate uh, a wedding. You know, uh, it, this, this thing shouldn't have occurred, but it did. It doesn't look like Dinah put up much resistance. And uh, and so, you know, the men realize, the, the heathen guys realize, okay, we've, uh, we've, uh, we've stepped out of bounds here. And, and so they're, they're trying to make the best of this situation. The good news is, is that um, Shechem, he did love her. He he wasn't just going to, you know, use her and drop her. He thought, man, you know, I, I, I like this girl. I, I, I want to go ahead and marry her. So they're, they're trying to make arrangements. And as you read on down through the chapter, um, the sons of Jacob speak up and they act like they're negotiating. But they're not negotiating. They're setting a trap. And Jacob is not aware. He's taking his son's words at face value and his sons speak up and they say, you know what? We'll make a deal with you. We'll, we'll go ahead and do this where we can intermarry and we can become one big happy family. But, but you know, you know, uh, God has told us that we have to be circumcised and you're the uncircumcised. So if we're going to make this work, you know, you're going to have to become like we are and you're going to have to be circumcised. And um, verse 19. And the young man deferred not to do the thing. Look, verse 18. And their words pleased Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. And the young man deferred not. In other words, he, he didn't even hesitate. He deferred not to do the thing because he had delight in Jacob's daughter. And the Holy Ghost throws this in. The Holy Ghost tells you two things. First of all, he said, or we just read it. He said, this thing ought not to have been done. The Holy Ghost openly acknowledges it should not have been done. But the Holy Ghost also tells you something about a heathen man here. Verse 19, at the end of the verse, and he was more honorable than all the house of his father. Verse 24, and unto Hamor and unto Shechem, his son, hearkened all that went out of the gate of his city, and every male was circumcised all that went out of the gate of his city. And it came to pass on the third day when they were sore. You know, they were recovering and they, they really were in not a position to do much of anything. They would have been good, doing good to stand up and go to the bathroom. Verse, verse 25, and it came to pass on the third day when they were sore 
that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Simeon and Levi, Simeon and Levi, dying as brethren, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. And they slew Hamor and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their sheep and their oxen and their asses and that which is in the city and that which was in the field and all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives took they captive and spoiled even all that was in the house. And, you know, and Jacob, you know, Jacob, his boys are big boys. They're, they're adults. They're, they've been adults for quite a while. And Jacob's an old man and Jacob couldn't stop them. And Jacob says, uh, you guys, you guys have brought trouble on my head. I'm, I'm going to have a hard time getting out of it. He said, he said, the people in this land, they're going to hear about this and, and they're going to come after us. Well, it was the mercy of God that, uh, that they never did do that. They, the, the people of the land never did come after Jacob. But Jacob now, a number of years later, is on his deathbed. And you know, be sure your sin will find you out. And he says, cursed be their anger. Because it was cruel. Their anger was over the top. It was out of control. And in the wake of that anger came cruelty and murder and self-will. Self-will is, you know, I don't care. I'm just going to do what I want to do. Self-will, they destroyed property. They tore things. They just wreaked havoc and, and they justified it. And boy, their anger was costly. You know, here they are years later at the death of their father. And he has... No good thing to say. No blessing to pronounce. The Bible says, He that ruleth his spirit is better than the mighty. You know, we read stories, you know, about mighty men and great athletes and great warriors and, and all that stuff. And we, we marvel at some of the exploits that some of these people have done throughout history and even into the present day. But the Lord looks down and, you know, the Lord treasures the spiritual attributes above the physical. We, we are greatly impressed by physical feats. But the Lord said, he that ruleth his spirit is better than the mighty. But you come to Deuteronomy 33 and something is dramatic. You don't have to turn there because uh, actually where you need to turn next is Exodus 32. Exodus 32. When you get to uh, Deuteronomy there, Moses suddenly is pronouncing a huge blessing. It's so big it takes up several verses. Reuben's blessing took up one verse and hardly two lines at that. Levi's blessing takes up several verses. Boy, something had changed. Something had changed. Keep your place, but I'm going to read you what he says in Deuteronomy 33. Who said unto his father and to his mother, I have not seen him, nor did he acknowledge his brethren, nor knew his own children, for they have observed thy word. They have kept thy covenant. What, what does he mean? He uh, he, he didn't even know his parents. He, he didn't acknowledge his brethren. There was an event that occurred, and actually, actually, at least two events that occurred. And this is the first, Exodus 32. Exodus 32. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, up, make us gods, which will go before us. You remember the story? They're, they're, they're at Mount Sinai, and man, God has come down on Mount Sinai, and there is lightning and thunders and smoke coming off that mountain, and the people know this, this is God. It was incredible, and they're fearful, and, and God has 
just given Moses the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. And Moses is still up there. The Bible says he was up there 40 days. You know how long, you know, think about that. That's almost six weeks. And you know, they've heard, they've seen this demonstration of God and it's still happening. But Moses hasn't come down. And they, verse, th verse one, they saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount. The people gathered themselves together into Aaron and said, up, make us gods. Is that crazy or what? I mean, God is still in a raging fire at the top of Mount Sinai and they can still see it. You know, sometimes people do things Sometimes God's people do things that just defy explanation. It's just insanity. But that's what they did. Look at the last part of the verse. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we, we want not what has become. So we, we don't have a clue where Moses is. And Aaron said unto them, break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring, bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with the graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to, notice it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. They, they are now saying this is the God of heaven. This is the God that brought us out of Egypt. Verse 6. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Meanwhile, on the mountain, verse 7. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down. For thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And in the next several verses, Moses realizes that, that the children of Israel are now in serious trouble with God. He senses that God is very angry and God was, you know, God would have destroyed them and made a new nation out of Moses. But in, in these next several verses, Moses pleads on their behalf. And God says, okay, Moses. He says, I, I won't destroy them. And then Moses and Joshua start coming down off the mount, verse 17. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery. Neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome. But the noise of them that sing do I hear. Bit of a concert going on. Didn't sound spiritual. Verse 19. And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh into the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. And he took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder, and strawed it upon the water, and made the children of Israel to drink of it. And, and so suddenly he, he confronts Aaron, and he says, Aaron, what in the world is going on? He said, I left you here. You're the high priest. What is going on? And Aaron, you know, makes the, the craziest excuse and, and lies about what he did in verse 25. And when Moses saw, oh man, oh, Moses is still taking this in. He's just looking around going, what is going on? And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi, gathered themselves together unto him. Who? The sons of Levi. They gathered. Verse 27. And he, Moses, said unto them, 
Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man, watch, his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men for Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother. Now watch, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. Oh, they hadn't been blessed before. And they didn't know a blessing was coming. Just all of a sudden, Moses shouted out. He said, who is on the Lord's side? And the sons of Levi gathered, and he said, slay, verse 27, slay every man, his brother, and every man, his companion. You'll notice here, there were no heathen present. He's not talking about, you know, the lost. You know, he, he's not telling them to go bomb an abortion clinic. No, you know, that's the lost. You know, people get goofy ideas. And the lost are the lost are the lost. The heathen are the heathen. And the heathen do what heathen do. But suddenly the Holy Ghost comes up in Moses and he says, who is on the Lord's side? Man, a whole whack of the tribe. Who would have guessed it? The tribe of Levi. The ones that had no blessing of any kind. And they said, you know what? We're on the Lord's side. And Moses said, put your swords on. He said, go from gate to gate. And you know, for you and I, this is bizarre. This is hard for us to wrap our head around. But you got to remember that they have just insulted the God of heaven with one of the highest insults known to man. The God of heaven is still burning on Mount Sinai, has displayed himself, has displayed his holiness. They, he has just given the law of the Lord from heaven and they in less than six weeks time have said, we don't need you. You brought us out. We're, we're, we're just, you know, we're, we're just going to pretend you're something else, something that will suit us, something that will let us dance and jive and be naked in front of the whole world. We're just going to go that way. And God says, okay. He says, get out your swords. And the sons of Levi, And Moses said, slay them. You find in Deuteronomy 33 what is mentioned here. What set them apart was that it wasn't just strangers. You know, they could, they could go after the heathen. They, you know, um, uh, Simeon and Levi proved that long ago. They weren't afraid of the heathen. But that's not who these people were. These were their brethren. 3,000 men. You know, it, they, they went after the ringleaders and the glad participants that were just all too glad to say, I don't like this God. Let's pretend he's something else. And he said, consecrate yourself today upon your neighbor and upon your sons. Consecrate, he says, if you, if you do this, you'll cross the line for me. And he said, he will bestow a blessing this day. You know, that day was going to change everything for them. Nothing was ever the same for the tribe of Levi. You know what? God turned a curse into a blessing. You remember the curse was, God said, Jacob said, I'm going to scatter you in Jacob. And you know what? That curse came to pass. That, that was never lifted. But it was turned. It was overturned. Say, what do you mean? You know what the tribe of Levi had to do? They were the they became the priests and the and the helpers of the priests throughout Israel. And they were never given fixed places. They were they were not given a portion of land that was theirs. Reuben was given a massive portion. Judah was given a massive portion. Naphtali was given a massive portion. And Isaacar and Asher, and you could go on and on. But the sons of Levi were not given. Anything like that. They were literally scattered. They were given cities that were around 
they were given these little places in these suburbs that were around the other cities. And the tribe didn't live in one place. They were literally scattered throughout Israel. But God took that. That would have been a curse. You know, uh, later on, the Jews were scattered. But when they were scattered in captivity, I mean, they were scattered. I mean, like a shotgun. But this day would change everything. This day would change their future. This day. You know, uh, someone has said, your future is not determined by what you do tomorrow. Your future is determined by what you do today. What are you going to do today? You say, well, well, next week and next month and I'm going to. No, no, no. No, that's not your future. Your future is determined by what you do today. There was a second incident for the sons of Levi, and that was Numbers 25. You're in Exodus. The next book is Leviticus. The next book is the book of Numbers. Look at Numbers chapter 25. In Numbers 25, you see these words. It says, And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people into the sacrifices of their gods. And the people did eat and drink and bow down unto their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Boy, here it is again. Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before. It'd be awful, but wouldn't it be bad if, if the Lord came in this room with all the backsliders and all the people that are secretly really planning to do something wicked. And the Lord came in and said, give me your car keys. You'd be like, well, that's a bummer, you know, but uh, but that's not what he said here. He said, he said, I want their heads. He said, I want their heads. Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord, verse 4, against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And even while he's speaking, this happens. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses. I mean, you talk about brazen and bold. I mean, he's he's... He's within, you know, however many feet of Moses. And Moses is standing right there and he just prances right past Moses with this woman. And in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, he's a Levite, saw it. He rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand as a spear. And he went after that man, the man of Israel, into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. You know, it was pretty dramatic at Mount Sinai when 3,000 men died. But boy, on this occasion, it just, it got exponentially more drastic. They are, they are committing whoredom with the children of, of Moab, the daughters of Moab, and uh, and they're just, it's just brazen. And God begins to visit the people with the plague, and there's people dying, uh, suddenly dying all over that, that area. And yet, even while it's going on, you know, people that are bent on their sin, they're just bent on their sin. And and you, you there's people that really almost no penalty is going to shake them off. You know, you can threaten them with hell and damnation and, and, you know, sorrow. And there's just some people that there's just nothing going to face him. And this guy, man, it's the judgment is falling. And he just grabs this beautiful woman and just takes him into his tent. And a Levite, Phineas. And boy, there's something about this that caught God's eye. And Phineas says, oh, no. I'm going to put a stop to this. Who is on the Lord's side? And he grabs a javelin 
that dude who's just waltzed with that gal into the tent. And by the way, these women were set up by design. And that's another story. We can show you that later in the Bible. But this was all by design. This was a trap that was laid for the children of Israel. And man, they, they dropped into it hook, line, and sinker. And this woman, you know, they go in and man, they're just, they're just in the tent and they're just in a good tight embrace. And Phineas opens that tent door and whoo! And God said, God looked at that and God said, I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. And what does, what happens to this son of Levi? Look at verse 10. Verse 10. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, hath turned away my wrath from the children of Israel. Boy, it's amazing what one person can do. You know, you would think God, God could have set the price so high that nobody could have stopped the plague. But that's not our Lord. And I sought for a man among them that should stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. He said, I'm just looking for one. Well, it's amazing what one person can do. You undervalue what you can do. One man did it. One man stopped this plague. Verse 11, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, hath turned away, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel while he was zealous for my sake, not to get his name in the paper and not to get a, you know, a public announcement. This thing was, there was just, it was going bonkers. He, he had no time even to think about you know, well, I'll, I'll be the big dog. No, no, he, he just, he just, he's, he was thinking about the Lord. He said, oh, no. He said, these people, they are spitting in God's face. And he says, he says, I can't stop them all, but I can stop this one. And God said, wow. God said, I like that. Verse 12, verse 12, wherefore say, Behold, I give unto him, I give unto him, a Levite, my covenant of peace, and he shall have it. Wow, this blessing's huge. And his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. Go to Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33. It looks like there was a third incident. I looked at these verses and I, I puzzled over verse eight this week and I thought about it and I thought, what in the world is this talking about? And I tried to find some information on it. Look at verse eight. And of Levi, he said, let thy thummim and thy urim be with thy holy one. That The thummim and the urim, that was a way that they sought direct counsel from God. The priest wore an ephod. On that ephod was a thing called the Urim and the Thummim. And we don't, the Lord doesn't tell us much about it. But we find that David, on one occasion, he wanted to inquire of the Lord. And he went to the priest and he went to the ephod, to the Urim and the Thummim. And God spoke through that. Okay. So it was a way of getting counsel from the Lord. And he says, God says to Levi, he says, let the, the Thummim and the Urim, he said, I'm going to, I'm going to give that privilege to Levi. He said, he's, he's the Holy One. He said, he's the one that chose the Lord when nobody else did. Look at the rest of the verse. Whom thou didst prove at Massa and with whom thou didst strive at the waters of Meribah. Those of you that, you know, are reading your Bible through, you know, you're going to come across that passage. Well, the ch children of Israel were at Massa and Meribah. It's in, it was in a place called Rephidim and um, they ran out of water. And man, they, they, uh, they got really upset with Moses and uh, they did one of their classic things where they blamed everything on Moses. And they said, Moses, you know, you, you better do something. You brought us out into this wilderness to kill us. It wasn't Moses had done that. It was God. God had brought him to that place. And man, they're just furious. And there God said to Moses, he says, I'm going to bring you over here to this rock. He said, strike this rock and water will gush out. And it did. 
And um, and God called that place Massa and Meribah. And in the original passage there, back in the book of Exodus, he has nothing good to say about anybody there except Moses. But when you read this passage, it looks like once again, the sons of Levi, the Lord doesn't tell us what they did, but there was something they did. They weren't on board with all the people that were just blaming God for everything. They weren't on board. And God says, I remember that. Hey, you know, we often think, you know, you know, and we, we, it's true. God remembers, you know, everything and, and, um, and thank God if you're saved, you know, when you put your trust in Christ, he blotted out your record of your sin, past, present, future. Praise the Lord for that. But you know, one of the amazing things about our Lord is, is um, he remembers the good things. If you're a believer. He remembers the good things. You read the Hebrews 11, that chapter on faith. Man, there's people mentioned in those chapters that you and I really probably would not have put in there. You know, he mentions David. And, you know, David committed adultery and murder. Uh, he mentions Jephthah. And some of you know what Jephthah did. Jephthah pulled a dumb stunt. He mentions Samson and all the ridiculous stuff that Samson did. And yet, you know what he mentions there in the chapter on the Hall of Faith? He doesn't mention their shenanigans. He mentions the times when they trusted God and just did the right thing. In Hebrews, it says, God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. You know, the, the, one of the blessings, we, we fear the judgment seat of Christ as believers, not because, not because my, my sin, your sin as a believer, that's paid for, it's done. But you know, the judgment seat of Christ will be where God reviews, you know, I gave you, I gave you 20 years as a believer. I gave you a bunch of opportunities, you know. I gave you some talents. What did you do for me? And that's what's going to be reviewed. And you know what? That will be, it'll be, it really will be a fearful time. It, our, our hell is not in question because as a believer, you're the Lord's, you're saved eternally, you're, you're secure. But it's the same idea as when, you know, those times growing up when your dad asked you to do a job and, and later on he went and checked on the job you did. It didn't, if you did a bad job, it didn't make you not his son or not his daughter. But, but if you did great, that accounting was. Whew. And if you and if you didn't do so good, it was fearful. God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love and all the things that you've done for the Lord and for his people. God says, I don't forget those. He, something happened at Meribah and Massa, and God doesn't tell us what it was, but God never forgot it. And God said, Levi, I, uh, I remember when you stood for me in Exodus 32. And I remember when you stood for me in Numbers 25. And God says, I remember when you were on board with me at the waters of Meribah and Massa. And God says, you know, you know, Levi, you know, you guys didn't start out very good. But he said, man, I, I still think about those things you did for me. Look at verse nine. Who said unto his father and to his mother, I have not seen him. Neither did he acknowledge his brethren nor knew his own children. Again, at the uh, at, at Mount Sinai, um, you know what they did? They um, they they killed all the ringleaders. They 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 didn't have pity on anybody that was that was jumping down that crazy road. Um, and what I want you to understand is not all of the tribe of Levi would follow the Lord. You know, a blessing comes to the tribe of Levi, but not all of the tribe of Levi followed the Lord. You say, how do you know that? Well, if you read in the book of Judges and uh, you, you'll come along through there and you'll find at least two Levites that were absolutely, totally abandoned the Lord and went into apostasy and, and uh, they were just a disaster. But many of the Levites stayed true. And you see that 1,500 years later, an angel comes to a man named Zacharias, who was a, 
uh, doing his course of the priesthood, and he was of the line of Abiah. And, and to, to be in that line, you had to be a son of Levi. And here he is 1,500 years later, and here's Zacharias and Elizabeth, and then they give birth to John the Baptist. And it says in Luke chapter 1, verse 6, they continued in all the commandments and ordinance of the Lord, blameless. You know, 1,500 years later, there were still some of that tribe that were still following the Lord. They were still zealous. They were still on the Lord's side. And God was still first above all. You know, God knows the end from the beginning. And God knows how it's all going to turn out. And God keeps his promises. And suddenly you, you come to Deuteronomy 33. And whereas it was dark when they stood in front of their father, Jacob, now they stand in front of Moses and the Holy Ghost pronounces a blessing on them. They honored God first of all. They honored God. How did they get the blessing? They honored God first. You know who you know who they had to you know who they had to deal with? He said, they looked at their parents and said, I have not known him. They, they didn't honor their own children. When they pulled those swords and Moses says, slay them all. Some of their children died that day. Some of their parents died that day. You know what? Uh, there's this thing that's going to happen in your life sooner or later. And, um, you know, unless you get saved at 75 and your parents are with the Lord. Um, boy, there's just times when... The dearest ties on earth will put you in a horrible predicament. And the dearest ties on earth, and you love them, and you honor them. God said, honor thy father and thy mother. That it may be well with thee, and that thy days may be long upon the earth. But boy, oh boy, sometimes your relatives will put you in a quandary. Uh, some, of, some of your dearest friends on earth, they're, they're going to put you in a quandary. And God looks down and he says, I wonder what they'll do. Now, nah. I guess we're going to see if they'll honor me, first of all. You know, uh, I, I don't know how your life has started out. I don't know how your Christian life has been going. I don't, I don't know. But it, it could be that maybe it has not gone well. You know, um, there may be some things in your life that God is not blessing. But I tell you what, um, sometimes it's, it's not as hard as you might think, to turn that around. Um, God still honors people that will put him first, above the dearest ties on earth. They had put the unseen above the seen. They had put God's word above man's. Verse 9, they have observed thy word. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. He gives them a blessing. Look at verse 10. They shall teach Jacob thy judgments and Israel thy law. They shall put incense before thee and whole burnt sacrifice upon thine altar. Bless Lord his substance. You know what part of the blessing that God gave them? What it was a spiritual thing. It was an honor. It was a privilege that they would become God's mouthpiece. God would honor his word when it was spoken through their mouth. Now, you guys know as well as I do that the devil can speak God's word. And you see that when the devil showed up uh, in, in uh, the New Testament there and tempted the Lord, that the devil actually quoted scripture to the Lord. Out of context, of course, but he quoted it. Um, you know, the Lord does not honor the word through everybody's mouth. And, and, and again, you know that as well as I do. Um, man, I, I've heard of, I, I've, I've met people, and you have too, and we've heard of them that, that they were drunk. I mean, they, they were so drunk, their speech was slurred, and, and uh, they, could, they could quote Scripture to you. They could quote it. Uh, does God honor that? Are you kidding? You know, God can use Balaam's donkey. God can use anybody once, but there's no reward for that. But he was talking about consistently. You know, God said, and, and you, did you realize this wants, God wants this to be your privilege? You know, God wants to be able, you know, you want to, don't you want to be able to help one of your friends and, or, or help a, a, a relative? Maybe they're sick or help somebody that's in a bad way or help one of your own children. 
And you know what you're going to do? You're going to speak God's word to them. And you know, it means nothing unless God honors that word that's coming out of your mouth. God says, I'm going to bless them. Well, what are you going to do for them, Lord? He says, you know what I'm going to do? God said, they always sided with me. And so now I'm going to side with them. Wow, that sounds like a blessing to me, doesn't it to you? God said, they've, they've always chosen me. God said, I'm going to choose them. God says, bless their, I'm going to put the law in their mouth. Incense is a type of prayer. Look at verse 11. Bless Lord his substance. That's, you know what your substance is? That's your stuff. Bless your stuff. You know, wouldn't it be a blessing for God to bless your stuff? You say, well, that's carnal. No, it's not because God mentions it. You know, the children of Israel, they wandered through the wilderness for 40 years. You know what God did? Their shoes never wore out. Now, I know that'd be a disappointment for some of you. But but never, ever, 40 years, and they were wearing them every day. It's not like they were stuck in a closet and they were rotating them. Same shoes every day. Wouldn't it be a blessing for God to bless your stuff? God says, you know, he's saying, well, you know, I don't know about this Christianity stuff. You know, all that's all pie in the sky and all that spiritual stuff. Well, you haven't read very far, have you? The spiritual blessings are huge, but God says, and I, you know, just for good measure, I'm going to bless their stuff. Verse 11, bless Lord his substance, accept the work of his hands. Smite through the loins of them that rise against it. What a, what a strange thing. You know what the Lord said in the New Testament? The Lord said, he said, avenge not yourselves. He said, you're going to have people that hurt you and do you wrong. He said, he said, don't get it in your head that you're going to settle the score. He said, uh, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. He says here, Moses says, Lord, would you smite through the loins of his enemies? You, you realize what he just said? He didn't say, Lord, protect them. Well, that would be good enough, wouldn't it? That'd be good enough, you know, to be able to, to go out into a hostile crowd and just know that they weren't going to be able to hurt you. But that's not what he says. He says, Lord, he said, don't just protect him. He said, but vindicate him and strike back, Lord. Doesn't sound spiritual, does it? Doesn't sound very Christian. You ought to read your Bible. He said, Lord, would you make the enemies of Levi wish they'd never touched him? You say, does the Lord do that? Oh, he sure does. A number of years ago, there was a man that loved the Lord, served the Lord, and, and he had a bunch of homes for delinquents and uh, drug addicts and stuff. And, and, and this guy was the real deal. He loved the Lord. He was very successful at what he did in massive homes. And, and, and uh, you know, it's sort of like it is many times. If you're successful and you're helping people, the government usually often doesn't like that. And um, so the government stepped in and began to try to regulate him. And it turned into a massive legal battle that lasted for years. And he got up at, at a meeting, and I've, I've got the recording and, uh, and people all over the country were for praying for him. He became nationally known because of this court battle. And he said, well, he said, the count as of this day is nine dead that have opposed us. Nine dead. Nine dead. Oh, David said, oh, he was a man of war. He said, the Lord is my shield. The Lord is my defense. You know, Levi, he started off really bad. But suddenly Moses says, Lord, they have put you above all. Bless them. And God says, I think I'll do that. You know, you know what kind of God we serve? He's the God that will blot out your past and turn that curse that maybe you're still riding it. God says, you just, you just put me first. And God said, I'll turn it into a blessing. This is our God. This is your God. You know, it says about Jesus. He said, uh, you know, about the curse of the law. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And it says he was made a curse for us. You know, and here we are this morning. We're still riding out the curse of sin just a little bit. I mean, we're growing older and, and we're losing our hair. and Our glasses get stronger. And, you know, that's all part of the curse. But if you're a believer, oh, 
ever since the day you turned to him, it started a fountain of blessings. And that curse, boy, if we live to see the grave, oh, death, where is thy victory? Oh, grave, where is thy sting? Our curse ends in everlasting life. This is our God. Do you know him? And if you do know him this morning, if you do know him, don't be afraid to honor him above the dearest ties on earth because all that waits for you on the other side is a blessing. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, bless your truth. Lord, help people, Lord, wherever you have spoken, that they might see the truth, that it might shout at them, Lord, that they it might just be so big in front of their eyes, Lord, that they'll choose you. Lord,